Welcome to the Gnosis ACT Strategy Session. You'll want to have your score report in hand before you go through this session. So we're going to start on the first page of the report at the top where it says Diagnostic History. This tells you the name of the exam you took and then gives you your scores. Composite, English, Math, Reading, Science, and Writing. The range for each individual section, English, Math, Reading, Science, is 1 to 36, with 1 being the lowest and 36 being the highest, and the average on each one being a right around 21. The composite score is actually the average of the first four, English, Math, Reading, and Science. So when somebody says, what's your ACT score, they're asking for the composite, which is the average of those four sections. The writing score is actually a combination score. It's your English score plus your essay score. So if you don't submit an essay, then your writing score will be zero. Otherwise, it'll be um, some score between 1 and 36. Now you're probably wondering, okay, this is my score, but how does that compare? As I mentioned, the average score is around 21 on each of the sections. But if you look here on this slide, what you'll see is the national average, so a little more specific. But national versus Texas, you've got composite versus science, reading, math, English, and writing, and then the essay score. So you can see what the averages are for seniors who've taken the actual ACT exam. And then how do your scores compare? So now let's talk about the subscores, the next section on the report. Starting in September 2015, ACT introduced the um, subscores on the exam. So we'll take a look at each one of those. Okay, the first subscore on there is STEM, which stands for Science and Math. And that is a subset based on questions from the four sections, the English, Reading, Math, and Science. Okay, so STEM. The second subscore you'll see is ELA, which is the English and Reading section, English Language Arts. The third subscore you see there is, again, subdivided, but it's your writing subscores. And this is your essay, and we'll talk more about this later in those four categories that are under the writing. So the first question we usually get from students and parents at this point is, what's a good score? Is this score that I just did on my practice exam, is this a good score? So let's talk about some of the factors in determining whether a score is a good score. Okay, the first factor is grade level. Obviously, the higher your grade level, the higher your expected score. If you're taking this practice test as a ninth grader, we're not expecting you to score the same way that you will when you're a 11th grader or a 12th grader. So that makes a difference in what you should expect for your own scores. The second factor is college choice. So basically, the more selective and rigorous the program that you're applying to, the higher your score is going to need to be. So what makes a good score is determined by where do you really want to go to college? And everybody's answer to that question is going to be different depending on the university they choose. Now obviously, top 90th percentile scores are top 90th percentile scores. They're good scores wherever you're applying. But otherwise, what you're looking for is the average of those students who actually got admitted to the university that you want to go to. And you can find that information at collegeboard.org. A third factor in determining a good score is scholarships. The more scholarship money you want, the higher your score needs to be, because that's one of the factors that's used in allocating scholarship money, either for private scholarships or for scholarships within the university. Okay, and as I just mentioned, a good rule of thumb for what's a good score is you want to beat your top school's average score. And you can find that information at collegeboard.org under the score section. You'll see what their, um, the middle 50th percentile is for the ACT scores for the applicants who actually accepted, were admitted and accepted. And then you want to beat the average of that so that there's no question about whether or not you're going to fit academically. Okay, so next let's talk about a couple of general preparation tips. First tip we're going to give you is to take both the SAT and the ACT. You never know which one you're going to do better on, and it's not like you'll take one and get a score in the 70th percentile and take the other and get something in the 95th. What will typically happen is if you get a 70th percentile on one, then you take the other one, you'll get maybe a 74, or maybe a 68 percentile. But that little bit of difference in the score may be all the difference you need to meet a qualification cutoff for, let's say, a scholarship. So it's definitely worth it to take both scores. 
almost every university takes both exams. So do yourself a favor, give yourself both opportunities and take both exams. Second general preparation tip is to know that there's no set order of difficulty on the ACT or now on the SAT or the PSAT. So basically easy, medium and hard questions are all jumbled. That means that question number two in the math section may be the hardest question in the entire exam. Right? That's important to know. So you want to guess on and then flag hard problems and return to them at the end of the section if you've got time. But don't let it psych you out. Psychologically, you know, we're used to most of our exams being easy, medium, hard, and the ACT, the SAT, and the PSAT are not structured that way. So you've got to judge for yourself whether this question is hard for you. Be willing to guess on it and move on. And then the last general preparation tip is there's no wrong answer or penalty on the ACT, the SAT, or the PSAT. So the bottom line is guess on every problem. Do not leave anything blank. Okay, so now let's take a look at some ACT scores for some universities that tend to be popular among the students who take our practice exams. And this will help you answer that question, are my scores competitive? So these are score ranges for the middle 50th percentile of students who were accepted at some of these universities. So if you take a look down there, there's Baylor, there's Rice, there's SMU, Texas A&M, TCU, Texas State, UNT, University of Oklahoma, and University of Texas. So it tells you the uh, middle 50th percentile of students. So that means out of 100 students who were accepted, the middle 50 are in that score range for Baylor 25 to 30. That means 25 of those 100 students would be below a 25 and 25 would be above a 30. So if you're looking going, well, I've got a 23, can I get to Baylor? The answer is maybe, right? There's definitely 25 students who are below that 25, but the question is, you know, where does your score and all of your other qualifications fit in the mix? And then if you're above 30, are you a shoe in Not necessarily. Right? Because again, there's always something other than the scores that's contributing to whether or not you're going to be a good fit for that university. But assuming you get admitted, you're also much more likely to get academic scholarships because of where you are relative to the rest of the student body. Okay, the second column on this chart is percent admitted, and that tells you how selective the university is. So what percent of the students who applied were admitted to the university? And you see for Baylor, it's 44%. Rice more selective, 16%, versus let's say A&M, 66% admitted, or TCU, uh, 43. So that's how you read that chart. So of these, the least selective university is University of Oklahoma. 78% of the students who applied were admitted. Now, maybe the school that you're interested in wasn't on that list. No problem, as I've already mentioned, collegeboard.org is where you go to get this information. And when you get there, you select college search, you type in the university you're interested in, and then you'll go down to application, and under that you'll be able to see the scores for SAT and ACT. Okay, so now let's return to your score report. And let's look at the section entitled English. So this is your English performance evaluation. And what you'll see under here is your rhetorical skills and usage and mechanics. These are the two sections on the English test, the way the ACT divides the questions. Okay, the first column I want you to look at is actually that fourth column over, blanks. What do you want to see there? You want to see no blanks at all, no skips. Why are we looking for no skips? Exactly, there's no wrong answer penalty. That means you should never leave anything blank. If you bubble some answer, then you have some opportunity that you might guess and get it correct. Okay, the other columns on this section of the report give you the total number of questions in that subcategory of questions, how many you got right, how many you got wrong, and then the percent that you got right. So you can see on this particular test, and each test varies, so you can see there were 11 organization questions, 12 style questions, and then you can see the percentage. So my sample student got 55% of the organization questions right, but only 42% of the style questions. And then under usage and mechanics, you can see grammar, punctuation, and structure. So you always have those subcategories of questions, but the number of questions may vary by one or two, one way or the other. 
Okay, all of the grammar on the English portion of the exam is tested as a multiple choice question. It's tested within the context of a passage. It's tested the same way on the SAT and the PSAT. And here's the grammar that's tested. So there's comparisons. There's idioms, modifiers, organization, parallelism, pronouns, punctuation, right? Comma, semicolon, colon, what do you need here? Sentence structure, style, and subject verb agreement. All of those are tested on ACT, SAT, PSAT. And if you're looking at those terms and your eyes are starting to swim a little bit, glaze over, you know, you need to do some review. For most of our students, it's been a long time since they've actually had any formal grammar lessons. And this is tested, right? So it really helps to do some review on how the grammar is supposed to work. Right? What's the structure? So that you know what you're looking for on the exam and you also know how it's going to be tested. The bottom line is that in most of our schools, grammar just isn't emphasized. We focus on literature. So, you know, grammar concepts are relatively straightforward. They're easy to learn, but you have to work at it. You have to know what's right and what's wrong. And a good prep course will help you review that grammar. Okay, the last section on the report is the incorrectly answered. And this helps you answer the question, what did you miss? Okay, so if you're looking at re your report and you see that you missed eight in the organization under rhetorical skills, then this is going to tell you which specific eight did you miss. So in each one of the sections, you'll have the same subset, the same column. And this is where you'll look for details on what you missed or you skipped. So now look on your report just below where it says answers analysis and I want to take you through what that section represents. Q number tells you the question number within that section. The A and S row is the answer row so that is the right answer for the, each of the questions. Okay the third row is the mark. This is actually the grading of your exam. So if you got the question right there's a plus. If you missed it there will be the letter and that will be the letter of that you selected for that. And then if you skipped it, there will be a dash in there. Um, so that would mean that you put no answer to that question. So now let's take a minute to talk about scoring on the ACT. The ACT is essentially scored on a curve. So there's a raw score based on plus one if you got it correct. So if you look back over there and it said you've got 38 correct, then you're going to have 38 raw points. That score is then converted to a scaled score. That's the 1 to 36 score that is your ACT score in that particular section or the cumulative. All right, so now let's take a look at the math performance evaluation. This is set up the same way as the English, so we'll go through this a little faster. But again, you can see your subcategories of questions and then total in that how many you got right, how many you missed, how many you left blank, and then the percent correct, as well as the number that were, or the specific ones that were missed or left blank. Okay, what are you looking for in the blank column? Exactly, you should leave nothing blank. Everything there should be zeros. So my student hasn't been strategic when taking his practice exam. And why is it strategic to leave nothing blank? Since there's no wrong answer penalty, there's nothing to lose. Just take a second, bubble in an answer, and then move on. At least you've got some shot of getting it right. Okay, on the left-hand side, you can see the three major categories of questions that are always on the ACT exam. There's algebra slash coordinate geometry, there's elementary algebra, and then there's plane geometry and trig. And under those, you can see the subcomponents, the subtypes of questions. So under algebra and coordinate geometry, there's always exponents, there's always functions, um, graphing circles, maybe there's one, maybe there's not, inequalities, matrices, so you can see the types of questions that will appear, but you can see most of them, there's only one question in that subcategory, elementary algebra, the first one there that's under my green bar is equations, there are always going to be algebra equations on this exam, that's going to be clearly the most important category in this. So if you're not getting those 11 right, then you've missed a big opportunity to raise your score. And then same thing, under plane geometry and trig, you can see there's basic geometry like triangles and circles, but then there's also the sine, cosine, tangent. Okay, let's talk about a couple of math notes. 
one, there is absolutely no formula chart on the ACT math test. That means everything you need to know, you have to bring in with you, in your head, ready to use. Okay, and then the second point, which you've already made on a broader scale, is that math does not go in order of difficulty. That means that question number two might be the toughest question in the math section. So you need to practice so that you'll be comfortable skipping around. And by skipping, I mean, you look at number two, you're like, oh, geez, that's a tough one. That's, you know, that's one of the ones that I just don't know how to do well. I'm going to mark C, I'm going to circle it, and move on. I'm not going to waste a lot of time because number three is probably going to be a lot easier. And that's psychologically something you need to practice because that's not how most of our math tests are set up in our math classes. So we're used to thinking, I should really try on the first ones because the last ones on the test are going to be the hardest. But that won't be true for the ACT, the SAT, or the PSAT. Okay, so now, what's the highest level of math that's tested on the ACT? As we've already seen, Algebra 2 is on there as well as trig. So there's sine, cosine, tangent, logs, matrices, graphing circles, and imaginary numbers. So that is as complex as it gets. It's not calculus, it's not differential equations, but it is Algebra 2 and trig. So most of you guys will actually know these concepts. You've seen them in your math classes. The issue is, do you know how they're going to be applied on the test? So what you're going to want to do as you prepare for the exam is to actually get some experience with how these concepts are tested on the ACT or the SAT or the PSAT because that's going to be the difficulty in applying what you know. Okay, the next section on the report, just like the English, is the math performance analysis. This gives you your answers and whether or not you got them correct. The top row with the Q number is the question number. The row labeled A and S is the right answer on the exam. And then the last row with mark is a plus if you got it correct, a letter if you answered it incorrectly. So in this case, my sample student in number seven put a B when it should be a D. And then there'll be a dash if you left it blank, if there's no answer marked. The next section on the report is the reading performance evaluation. And it's set up the exact same way. Again, first thing I want you to look at is the blank column everything in that column should be a zero and if it's not then the next time you take a practice exam or the real exam make sure you leave nothing blank. Why should that always be zero? Exactly. There's no wrong answer penalty so you may as well put some answer because then you have some possibility of getting it correct. Okay the other columns on the chart tell you the total number in that question category, how many you got right, how many you got wrong, and then your percent correct, just like the other two sections we've already taken a look at. Okay, in reading, you've got four major passage types that will always show up on every exam. There's a humanities passage, a natural science passage, a prose fiction passage, and a social science passage. So those four show up on every single exam. Basically, the passages can be about any subject. The important thing for you to know is that everything you need to know to answer the questions correctly is actually in the passage itself. You're not expected to bring outside knowledge about natural science or prose fiction into the passage with you to answer the questions. Everything you need is already written. The ACT reading comp questions are basically your standard reading comp questions. So big picture, detail, main idea, inference, vocabulary, logic. You've got some compare and contrast now. You've got some um, cause and effect, but basically it's your standard questions for reading comp. Okay, your reading performance answers analysis is set up the same way. So you've got the question number, you've got the right answer, and then that last column is if you got it right or if, in which case you get the plus, or if you missed it, then what letter did you put or did you leave it blank? Okay, the last part on your report is your science performance. And again, this is set up the same way. So you can see the total number for each type of question, how many you got right, how many you got wrong, and how many you left blank. And again, of course, when you look at the blank, what should you be looking for? Exactly, you should leave nothing blank. There is no wrong answer penalty. Okay, you can see here the four different types of passages you'll get biology, chemistry, physics, earth sciences. You get those on every exam and it's just a matter of whether you get two biology passages or two earth sciences or whatever. So you're going to have seven total passages. It's just a matter of how they're going to be divided among these subcategories. 
Okay, a lot of people look at ACT science and they think, oh, well, I'm really great in science classes, so I should take the ACT rather than the SAT because it's got science on it and that's a strength for me. Well, it's not actually true. The ACT science isn't about the science you remember from your physics or your biology or your chemistry class. It's about reading complex graphs. So if you are good at reading complex graphs, interpreting data, then this will be a section that's easy for you. And regardless of how much you remember from your physics or your chemistry class, if you aren't good at paying attention to detail and reading complex graphs, then this section is going to be difficult for you. Because just like in the reading comp, everything you need to know is in the passage. So you don't have to bring a physics formula with you or a chemistry formula with you. You've just got to know how to read what's there and use the data that's provided. Okay, the science performance answers analysis says set up the exact same way with the question number, the correct answer, followed by your answer, whether you got it right, wrong, or left it blank. Okay, so now we're going to go back to page one and look at the writing subscore. This is your essay score. So this was on the very top of the first page where we had the subscores for STEM, ELA, and then the writing subscores, and there are four of them. So each essay is scored by two graders in four subcategories. And the four subcategories are as zero to six in each one of them. And those categories are information and analysis, development and support, organization, and language use. So you've got a maximum of 24 possible points when you combine those four sections. Okay, a zero in any section would mean a zero in all the sections, and that would mean your essay was either off topic or illegible. Otherwise, you will get a score of one to six. And each essay is scored by two different graders in the subcategories. So then that means that you're going to have a score of 2 to 12 in each one of those subsections. Okay, so let's look at the essay for a minute. A couple of notes. One, the essay topics are nuanced. You're given three perspectives provided on some current issue, and you have to address those perspectives. So the actual ACT task says that you need to analyze and evaluate the three perspectives that are given. So if you only deal with one of them, your perspective or a perspective you disagree with, whatever, but if you only deal with one or you only deal with two, you're going to get a low score. You also have to state and develop your own perspective. And it could be one of the three, but likely it's going to be a nuanced position that's not quite one of the three. And then the third piece of the task is explain the relationship between your perspective and the three that are given in the essay prompt. So the bottom line is, if you want to do well on the ACT essay, you have to interact with the three perspectives and provide a nuanced argument. So now let's take a look at the score. So each grader gives you a score of one to six, assuming it's on topic and legible. So a six is effective. A five is well-developed and a four is adequate. A three is said to represent developing skill with the language. A two is either inconsistent or very weak skill with the language. A one represents little or no skill with the language and with the argument. And then of course a zero is either off topic or completely illegible. So if you decide to write an essay on why you want to go to A&M, you're going to get a zero. Okay, the dividing line between the scores or among the scores is between the four and the three. A four and above is good, adequate, well-developed, effective. A three and below, developing and consistent, weak, little, no skill. Yeah, those aren't scores you want to get. Okay, so these descriptors are all from ACT, so NOSIS didn't make them up. Um, so if you find them a little harsh, well, you know, that's the reality. Now remember, each subscore is going to be on a 0 to 12 range. So if you got a 6 on your essay, you're going, oh, yay, I got a great score. Wait a minute, it's on a 0 to 12. So you want 8 and above um, to be in that good category. Okay, and the way you read this, if you've got, your scores have to be close together. So they can't be more than a point apart. And that means if you've got a 3, then one grader gave you a 1 and one grader gave you a 2. 
If you've got a 7, a greater gave you a 3 and a 4. If you've got an 8, you've got a 4 and a 4. A 9, a 4 and a 5. So you can't have a 9 and it be a 3 and a 6 because you can't have scores that are more than a point, a, a, more than a point apart. So that's how you can determine what scores the two different graders gave you. Okay, so now let's look at the details. So if you'll turn to page three of your report, you should see information about your essay scores. So the first thing I want to point out is that you see your total score by category. So each of those four categories, you'll see your score on the one to 12 range or the zero to 12, as one to 12 of you actually wrote on topic. Underneath that heading then is a description of the scores. So like in this case, my sample student got an eight in information and analysis. And what it tells me underneath is an eight is two fours. So the next time you wanna strive for a five or higher. And it gives you the descriptions from ACT for what's a five and what's a four. So that way you know that when you read through the fours, that's what the essay graders thought of this particular essay. Same thing under development support, the student got an eight, so that would be two fours. So the student should strive for fives or higher on the next practice exam or the real exam. Okay, so now let's return to page one and talk about how the essay affects your overall ACT score. Okay, as we mentioned earlier, the English equals your multiple choice grammar score. The writing is your English score and your essay scores combined. So that's when your essay actually figures in. On each one of those, English, writing, the range is one to 36. So you can see in both cases, my student here is below the average, which we said was basically a 21 in each one of the sections. So the writing score is a combination of your English performance on the multiple choice grammar and your essay. But does the essay count as part of your composite score? And the answer to that is no, it's completely separate. Remember your composite score was the average of those first four, your English, your math, your reading, and your science. It does not include your writing, so essay is not part of the composite ACT score. So the next question that might come to mind is, well, if it's not part of the score, is it important? So what you need to be asking is, do the universities use it? And the answer to that is, it depends. Some universities require it, and a lot of the really selective ones will definitely require it. So to be safe, you should always take the ACT with the optional essay. Otherwise, you might have to take the entire exam again if you find out that you need the essay for one of the universities you're applying to. Okay, so now let's switch gears, and I wanna talk about some things you can do to help yourself get ready for the ACT exam. First thing you can do is complete the ACT question of the day. So if now they don't have an app, but they do have a question of the day and you can access it at the website actstudent.org. Would also strongly recommend you do the SAT question of the day. It's available at collegeboard.org, but it's also um, available as an app. And then they also have a Twitter feed for the SAT question of the day. And because there's so much overlap in how the ACT, the SAT, and the PSAT test questions, test content, it's useful to actually do both, even if you only intend to apply, or even if you only intend to take one of the exams. The other thing we'd recommend you do is check the Gnosis SAT and ACT question of the day blog. And that's available at mynosis.com slash blog. And the really great thing here is you'll see sample problems, but also really clear, logical, step-by-step -step explanations. And the great thing as you're preparing is that these things are searchable by topic. So if, for example, on this report, you see that you're weak in triangles or fractions or circles, you can go to our website and type in circles and then see all the problems that we've done with circles. And that will give you step-by-step -step directions. It'll give you a way to work through targeted sections of the exam to improve your strengths and weaknesses. Gnosis has released some self-study aids. So if you're wondering, you know, what can I do? How can I prepare this? Um, we have got some materials that you can use to study at home to raise your score. First thing we've got is navigating the SAT. And I know it says SAT and we're in an ACT score report session, but there is so much overlap in the content tested and the format of the questions that preparing for one helps you prepare for the other. So highly recommend this book. It's available in two formats as a printed book through Amazon and an ebook as a Kindle book. 
Um, we also have math practice books available. There's 150 math questions in each one. There's a SAT and ACT style. The basic math is basically the pre-algebra. So if it's been a while since you've done some of that pre-algebra stuff and you need a refresher, I'd recommend you start there. The advanced math includes 50 pre-algebra, 50 geometry, and 50 algebra problems. Again, these are available on Amazon as a printed book as well as as an ebook on Kindle. Okay, the next thing we'd recommend as you begin to prepare for the exams is to start building your vocabulary. Right? Even though there are no longer any sentence completion questions, right, you know just from this practice exam alone that the passages are dense, college-level reading. The vocabulary is tough, and the vocabulary and the questions can be tough. And you may have had that experience on this exam. Like you read a question, and there's some key word in the question you don't actually know. And that obviously is going to impact your ability to answer questions correctly, accurately, quickly. So weak vocab slows you down, makes the passages hard to understand, and then obviously messes you up on vocab and context questions, which show up on SAT, ACT, and PSAT. So improving your vocab will obviously help on the reading comp portion. It will also help on your essay, when, which, you know, you're writing for ACT, you write one for SAT, but it's also going to help for your college admissions essays, your college level reading, I mean, basically, there's no place that vocabulary doesn't help you. So highly recommend that you start working on vocabulary now, build it slowly and consistently in the time you've got so that you really master the vocabulary that's tested on these exams. Gnosis has two different sets of vocabulary that we'd recommend. Um, we've got SAT vocabulary and PSAT. Either one of these will help you with your reading comp and your ACT um, essay. The SAT, if you think about it in terms of level, SAT is actually like level 1 and PSAT is level 2. may sound counterintuitive, but our PSAT materials are written for those who are targeting the 95th percentile scores. So they're targeting the highest level scores. So if you've already got a strong vocabulary, I'd start with the PSAT box. If you know that your vocabulary is average or below average, start with the SAT and then build up. Both of these are available on Amazon as a box set. They are also available in multiple formats. So they're an app on iTunes and Google Play Store. They are also uh, like a flip book in Kindle. So lots of ways that you can use these flashcards, just a matter of what's going to be most effective for you and your learning style. A new set of flashcards that we've released recently is our homophones and frequently confused words. This category is explicitly tested on ACT, SAT, and PSAT, and it's a common problem for all of us. Words like confusing words like accept and accept, access and excess, affect and effect, allude and elude, using amount when you should be using number, using less when you should be using fewer, confusing complement and complement. Right? So if any of those make you go, Oof, right? This is the box set for you. It's in addition to vocabulary, it's a completely separate skill set, but it's 300 sets of these frequently confused words and homophones. It is only available as a box set right now through Amazon, and um, we'll be getting it up onto Kindle format soon, but we don't have an app in the works yet. Okay, so now let's switch gears and talk about when you should prepare. What's the preparation timeline? And basically, your goal should be to lead up to the March or April exam of your junior year. In the meantime, you want to take practice exams. You want to do your preparation. And when your practice exam scores show that you're ready, then go take the real exam. But there's no point taking it in, you know, like preparing and doing this the summer before your junior year. You, because the score you really want is at the very end of your junior year. Okay, so your goal should be to get the score you need for the university of your choice by the end of your junior year. So do all of your prep work, everything beforehand, and then take the SAT and the ACT in March or April of your junior year. Once you get your score back, if it's not the score you need, you still have time to do some additional review and then retake the exam in either May or June. But the bottom line is, before you leave for the summer, leading into your senior year, you want to have these exams over and done with. You want to have maximized your score, and you're ready for your application process. 
do not wait until the fall of your senior year. That creates a high stress testing situation where you've put all the pressure on yourself because for most universities that October or September exam is going to be the last one you can take and still get your scores in on time to meet the deadlines for either admissions and or financial aid. So it's really important that that not be your one and only shot to get the score you need. Okay, if you're an athlete and you are hoping to continue with athletics in college, you need to register with the NCAA Clearinghouse as a junior. And then you register for the SAT or the ACT and you include the um, eligibility code for the center, 9999, so that the scores automatically go to the clearinghouse. In order to be admitted as an athlete, you're going to have to meet minimum scores. On the SAT, what they're looking at is the sum of your math and verbal scores, so the two scores that you now get. The ACT, it'll be the sum of the four sections. So the ones that get average to be your composite, it'll be the sum of those four, reading, English, math, and science. For Division I, there's going to be a sliding scale of test scores plus your GPA and core courses. And you can see the numbers there. Um, Division II, they're going to have minimum scores for SAT, ACT, and again, these are the sums of the two or the four with the ACT, plus a minimum GPA. So it depends on which level of um, university you're applying to. All of this information is available at the NCAA Clearinghouse website, but you know it's important that you get these scores out of the way because without them, the recruiting process cannot move forward. Okay, if you are a top scoring student, if you've got that potential to be in the 95th percentile and higher, then the PSAT in October of your junior year is going to be an important test for you. All juniors who take the PSAT are automatically signed up for the National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test, the NMSQT. Now, for most juniors, the PSAT is just a practice exam. But if you've got that potential to reach national merit commended and higher, that's where scholarship recognition and money comes into play. And if you are in that category of student, then this is a really important for, test for you. This is your high stakes test. And it's worth it to put prep and time, money, energy into getting ready for this exam so that you can do your very best on it. If you are not at that 95th percentile and higher level, then the PSAT is a practice exam. So don't stress about it. Don't, you know, pour thousands of dollars into private tutoring, but do your best and it'll give you a good indicator of how you would likely do on the SAT. Now, if your sophomore PSAT score is an 1100 or higher, then you should really focus on preparing for your junior PSAT because it's only your junior score that counts. So even if you got a perfect score as a sophomore, you will not get national merit scholarship or commended or semifinalist, any of that, until your junior year. It is only your junior year score that counts. So that is the one day, that one test, the high stakes exam. So make sure you do well your junior year PSAT. Now, what about retaking the ACT? Can't you take it a couple of times? And the answer is sure. You can definitely take the ACT multiple times. And a lot of students will take the test two or even three times. But it actually makes more sense to take practice exams until you know that you're prepared for the real exam. There's no point going in and wasting the money, the energy, the stress, until you're actually ready for the exam. Some students seem to think, if I just keep taking the exam, my score is going to go up. But bottom line is, unless something unusual happened on test day, like you know, you were taking the exam last month and you got deathly ill, you spent 30 minutes in the bathroom, you were queasy, right? There's no reason to think that this time your ACT is going to score, your score is going to go up just because you're taking it again. So if you're taking the test over and over again without doing anything in between, you just need to know that it's as likely that your score will go down as it is to go up. So it's really only that preparation in between that would cause you to to realistically believe your score will go up. So bottom line, good preparation is what makes repeating the test worthwhile. You know, there's no point, you know, being one of those parents or students who calls and says, I've taken the ACT three times and my score still hasn't gone up. And, and then, you know, somebody on the other end says, well, what did you do in between? And the answer is, uh, nothing. Well, you know, in that case, there's really no reason to expect your score to go up. It's going to take work to change that score. 
Now another frequently asked question is, how do universities treat multiple test scores? And the answer to that is, it depends on the university. Most universities will take your best subscore. So let's say you've submitted two scores, um, two test administration scoreboards. So they'll say, oh, well your best math was in January, and your best science was in March, and your best reading was in March, and your best English was in January. And they'll put that together, and that'll be your ACT score for them. But they don't all do it that way. So how do you know how they're going to handle it? You just call, and you can call an admissions department anonymously. You don't have to tell them who you are, and just say, how do you guys handle multiple SAT scores, multiple ACT scores? What do you do with them? What are you looking for? Now, you may have heard about score choice, and both the SAT and the ACT offer score choice, and that is where it lets you decide which test administration score report you want to send to a university. So not your subtest, but your actual administration. So let's say, for example, you take the test in January and you take the test in March. Well, if you haven't done anything in between to prepare, then likely you're going to have that scenario I just mentioned. Let's say your math score is better in January, but your science score is better in March. So which one are you going to send? Hmm, probably both. So in many cases, you really don't have a score choice, and you should just assume that you're going to have to send all of your scores. Now, if you've done your preparation in advance and you know when you go in that's going to be your best score, then you know, that's the only one you'll need to send. Okay, one exception to be aware of is that some more selective universities actually require all the scores, so there is no choice in that case. They will say, send, all, send your complete score report, and you don't have an option to send just the January test or just the March test. So basically, the safest thing is to assume that you have to send all your scores, which is why it makes sense to use practice exams so that when you take the actual real exam, you know that's your best score. You're prepared, you're ready, and you're happy to send that score off for any university to see. Okay, so now let's take a look at the upcoming tests that you take in high school. The SAT and the ACT, these are both college admissions exams. Your timeline for that is spring of your junior year. And preparation for that is usually some sort of special focused test prep. Just doing well in your high school classes does not mean that you're going to do well on these exams. Part of it is because the exam covers material that you haven't seen in a long time. Let's say you're in calculus. Well, when was the last time you dealt with fractions? Right, so it's been a while since you've seen the pre-algebra. Or maybe it's been a while since you've seen the shapes and figures questions from the geometry that kind of thing. So you'll need some focused preparation, the grammar pieces. Um, PSAT, same thing, I already mentioned, that's the National Merit Scholarship Test. The only time that counts is October of your junior year, and again, if you really want to do well, that's going to require targeted test preparation, because just doing well in your classes, even in a wonderful school, doesn't mean that you're going to do well on these exams. Now practice exams, like you've taken this time, right? The goal here is to give you a realistic practice experience before you have to go in and take the real test. And you can take these any time, but we recommend you don't over-test. You don't want to, you know, drive yourself batty with this. We may offer five exams or seven exams throughout the school year. You don't want to take all of them and then, you know, be bored or annoyed with the exam. No preparation required to do these, but if you're using them strategically, then each time you'll take a look at that report and then focus on strengthening one of your weaker areas so that the next time you take a practice exam your score goes up. AP exams. These are exams that you'll take in specific subjects. They're used for college placement, for college credit. You take them generally through high school, um, maybe eighth grade depending on which courses you're in. And your preparation there is your actual AP classes. Generally, you don't need any additional work. If you're in a good, strong AP class, then you should be ready for the exam. Now, SAT 2s, have you heard about them? Those are your subject tests. Those are similar to AP exams. They are also used for college placement and admissions. And those you can take often spring of your junior year, fall of your senior year. And those are much more about what you've done in your high school classes. So just like with an AP exam, if you take one in AB Calculus, there's likely an SAT2 in the same thing. 
and this is something you need to look for in advance. So if you're applying to a selective university, let's say you're going to apply to Rice, um, they are going to want your SAT scores, your ACT scores, and then some SAT2 exams. And if you're applying in math and sciences, they're going to want maybe two or three SAT2 exams in those areas. And the smartest thing for you to do is to take a look and see when it makes sense to do those. You don't want to wait and stack them all up at the end. And then we'll come back to that in just one second. And then the last thing on here is your EOC exam. And that's the one that's actually required for your high school diploma. And again, your high school classes should prepare you for that. You shouldn't really need any additional studying. Okay, so that's an overview of the upcoming exams. Okay, now as I mentioned, your tougher universities may and often do require SAT to two exams, so the subject test. And what we'd recommend is that you take the SAT 2 in June after you take the related AP exam. So if you're taking an AP exam in May, let's say of your sophomore year, look and see if there's an SAT 2 exam. Because you've already done the prep for the AP exam, you may as well just roll that straight over, take the AP 2 exam. That way if you end up needing it, you've got it covered and you tested when everything was still fresh rather than waiting until let's say the end of your junior year or your senior year and going oh my I have to take AP or I'm sorry I have to take SAT2 exams and now you have to either refresh or go in cold and just not maximize your score so strategically much better to take the AP exams and the related SAT2 exams at the same time if there's any possibility you're gonna need them for admissions Okay, so now let's take a look at the SAT versus the ACT. Um, scoring, start there. SAT, your total possible score is between a 400 and a 1600. So two sections, each one 200 to 800. And the essay is optional. ACT, you've got the four test scores, average to be that composite score, and the range is one to 36. Each one of those individual tests is a one to 36. And again, the essay is optional. Neither test has a wrong answer penalty, so you should guess on everything. The length is about the same. SAT is 3 hours and 50 minutes. ACT is 3 hours and 35 minutes. They both have five sections, and you can take a look and see how these things are divided. But they've got reading, grammar. The SAT has two separate math sections, uh, one with calculator and then a short one without calculator, and then an essay. ACT has the reading, so same type of reading, same type of grammar. Math, the entire math section is one long section, and you can use a calculator on it. And then there's the science section, so that's the piece that's missing on the SAT. And then the essay, you've got 40 minutes instead of 50 minutes. So that's an overview of kind of the big picture of the exams. Okay, the area is tested. They both test reading, math, grammar, essay, writing. Um, they both test vocabulary. ACT tests science, but as we've already mentioned, the science is about complex reading, graphs. SAT doesn't have anything comparable to that. In terms of math, they both test arithmetic, algebra one, algebra two, geometry, trig. Okay, SAT has standard deviation, complex numbers, dividing polynomials. ACT has logs and matrices. Otherwise, they're basically exact same content. Now, take a look at the questions. SAT has 58 questions, ACT has 60. But the timing is where it's really different because SAT has 83 seconds per question. One minute, 23 seconds. ACT has one minute. So a lot less time per question on the ACT. Okay, science section. There's no science at all on the SAT. And like we said on the ACT, this is the analysis, the interpretation, problem solving of complex graphs. There are 40 questions, only 35 minutes, so about 53 seconds per question. Okay, both SAT and ACT test reading and it's in passages, so there will be passages, um, there will be questions, and if you look at SAT, 52 questions, ACT, 40 questions. But again, that time per question, SAT is a lot more time per question, 73 seconds versus 53 seconds. That's an extra 20 seconds per question on the SAT. 
grammar, same sort of setup. 44 questions versus 75 questions, and then SAT has 48 seconds per question, and a ACT only has 36. Essay, they're both optional, they're both the last section of the test, but again, remember what we said, they're optional for the test makers. They may not and often are not optional for the universities you're applying to. So SAT essay, 50 minutes, and it asks you to analyze the effectiveness of somebody else's argument. ACT is 40 minutes, and that's where you have to analyze and integrate the multiple perspectives. So two very different styles of essay. So two other things here. Almost every university in the US will accept either the SAT or the ACT. Same thing with scholarships, so take both. Score reporting, they both offer score choice, but again, depending on the university, you may not have a choice. Also, depending on how you perform, you may not have a choice. You may need to send multiple reports. So bottom line summary is, the two tests are basically equal but different. Benefits of the SAT, you've got more time per question and only four choices in the math. Benefits of the ACT, there's a calculator on all the math and there are no graphs in the reading and grammar sections like there are in the SAT. Okay, so a couple of tips. One, as we've said a couple of times, take both. Take the SAT and the ACT to maximize your chances of meeting requirements. Whether it's requirements for admissions, the requirements for scholarship cutoff, right? It's not going to be, you know, I take the SAT and I get an 80th percentile and then the next weekend I go take the ACT and all of a sudden I've got a 95th percentile. The tests are way too similar for that. You're probably going to get an 80th percentile in one and then a 77th or an 85th or an 83rd percentile in the other. Part of it's going to depend on the day, your energy level, what you did the night before. It's all of those things factor in. But if that cutoff score happens to be an 82 percentile, and you got an 80th on one test and an 83 on the other test, then, you know, that, that tells you which one you're going to submit. So it's important that you maximize your chances to meet the requirements for either scholarships or admission. And then the second tip, we've said this before, I'll say it again. Preparing for one helps prepare you for the other. So preparing for the SAT will help you prepare for the ACT and the PSAT. Same thing, ACT preparing for that helps you prepare for the others. Now there's some differences, particularly in the essay and on the ACT with that science section. So you'll want to do some specific training on the different exams, but for the most part, preparing for one prepares you for the other. Okay, thank you so much for participating. We look forward to working with you in future exams. If you'd like more information on Gnosis resources to help you ace the exam, either our self-study resources or our tutoring resources, then please visit our website at www.mynosis.com. Have a great day.